I'm going to talk to you about Deuteronomy and living the victorious Christian life. Now, the name Deuteronomy, what does that mean? Well, Deuter means second, and Onomy means law. So this book is the second giving of the law. And it begins in year 40, the 11th month, and day 1, from the Exodus. The author is Moses, and this is the last book of Moses. Now, historically, the, the parents of the first generation who weren't going to go into the land, they failed to teach their kids the law. So Moses has to go back over it with them. So it's, all, it's also called the Book of Remembrance. And this is the last words of Moses to Israel. Now, practically, that's the problem of many parents today is they're failing to give their children the Bible. Some Christians will wander in the wilderness and they'll never live the victorious Christian life. This book has 34 chapters, 959 verses, and around 28,352 words. But chapter 1, Moses talks about Israel's past failures. And this should remind you, if you're going to live a victorious Christian life, don't wander around for 40 years <clears throat> and not try to accomplish anything. In Deuteronomy 1, 2, and 3, it says there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the 40th year and the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according unto all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. So there was 11 days journey that turned into 40 years. They wandered around. In Psalm 90 and verse 9, it says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. In your Christian life, when you believe the gospel, you started on your journey. You started writing your story. What was wrote down? Was there anything good written down? Is it a story of just a tragedy? Or is it a story of accomplishments and Christian service? You're writing the story of your life. You are building a building to present to the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. Time is a gift and every second counts. Don't just wander around in the wilderness for 40 years and not do anything. You see, when, when Israel refused to go in and possess the land, they, they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. That pictures the Christian who gets saved and never begins to live for the Lord. He doesn't go into the promised land. He doesn't ever start living that victorious Christian life. In chapter 3, you see that Joshua is a picture of Jesus Christ and Moses is a picture of the law. And if you're going to live a victorious Christian life, you're going to have to realize that it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ and His righteousness. And what you do, you're doing it as an unprofitable servant at best is what you are. If The greatest Christian soldier is an unprofitable servant at best. It's all about what Jesus Christ did. And Joshua pictures Jesus Christ and Moses pictures the law. Don't be deceived like the Galatians into thinking that you're, you're good enough to keep your salvation. They had them teachers coming in, deceiving them into thinking they're good enough to keep it and that they can do works that's good enough to prove it. In Deuteronomy 3.28, it says, But charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. It's the same way Moses couldn't lead the people into the promised land, and Joshua does. This pictures how the law can't get us anything, but Jesus Christ can. Everything you do, you, you need to acknowledge Jesus Christ. You need to give him the glory for saving you. You need to give him the glory for keeping you. You need to give him the glory for getting you into your eternal home and, and your future glorified body.
If you're going to live the victorious Christian life, you need to realize who got you the victory. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Who got you the victory? Who caused you to triumph? In chapter 6, it talks about teaching the children. If you're going to live the victorious Christian life, then you are passing what you know on to the children. In Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. When you're sitting around the table, you need to talk about the Bible. When you're sitting on the couch, you need to talk about the Bible. When you're driving up the road, you don't need to be listening to the music of this world. Put in some Christian music, some godly music. Train them up. Put in audio of the scriptures. Go over Bible verses that you've learned. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, when they go to bed, teach them the Bible. When they wake up, teach them the Bible. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house and on thy gates. Put the word in them. If you get the word in them while they're young, it's going to affect them when they're older. Just like the sodomite movement. They're, putting this, they're trying to put all this junk in their mind while they're young. They're trying to recruit them while they're young. They want a big perverted society. We need to combat that and teach them the scriptures. How are they going to have a victorious Christian life? I mean, the way things are looking, the, the devil is in an all-out battle to try to not even let them ever even get saved. In chapter 7, you're going to see that Israel's strength comes from God. If you're going to live the victorious Christian life, who are you leaning on? Where is your strength coming from? Are you trying to do everything by your own strength? Or do you realize where your strength is coming from? In Deuteronomy 7, 1, it says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. If, you, if you're a Christian, then th this world is more powerful than your flesh. The devil is much more powerful than your flesh. You're going to face things that are way bigger than you, your flesh is. But your strength doesn't come from your flesh. There's something in you that made the worlds. John said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Paul talks about in Colossians, you got Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Ephesians, he, he tells us how we're sealed into the day of redemption. He says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You got something in you that slung the sun into the universe. I mean, your strength comes from him, not yourself. This world is greater and mightier than your flesh, but it's not greater and mightier than the one who is in you. If you're going to live the victorious Christian life, you can't be relying on your flesh. you got to rely on the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 8, it reminds us we need, we need to remember what the Lord has done. In Deuteronomy 8, 2, and it says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. It says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness. Remember what the Lord's already done for you and that he can do it again. And you know that song, he'll do it again. In 2 Timothy 2, it says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Remember that. If Jesus Christ raised from the dead, then he's going to raise you from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, it shows us that 
our resurrection is just as sure that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If you can remember what the Lord has done, you're going to stop being worried about the future because he's going to do it. You know he's going to do it again. In chapter 9, Moses lets them know that their righteousness is no good. And that's it's not what it's not what uh got them victory. It says in Deuteronomy nine five, it says, Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations. The Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they weren't gonna go and possess the land because they were righteous or because they were good but because of the Father's sake, the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was because the Lord was going to give it to them, just like us. We didn't get our salvation because we deserved it. It says, There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We don't want to be ignorant of God's righteousness and go about to establish our own righteousness. Because we don't have any. It's all of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you got saved, God took your uh, folder out of, your, out of the file cabinet, took your rottenness out, and put the righteousness of Jesus Christ in. Because our righteousness is no good. And like I said, if you're going to live the victorious Christian life, you need to realize who is the one that's righteous. It's not you. You can't go through this life being full of pride and with a big ego and thinking you're the grandest thing on the Christian scene. Your righteousness is no good. In chapter 10, you see the new tablets of stone. In Deuteronomy 10, 1 and 2, it says, At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that, I, that were in the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. So you remember how Moses, the first time, he dropped the tablets, because he was so angry about what Israel was doing, and when they were dancing, and they made the golden calf. Now the Lord tells him to go back up, and he's going to write on two more tables of stone. Now the new t tablets of stone... That was just as much the Word of God as the first tablets of stone. And if you're going to live a victorious Christian life, you need to have faith in the book that God's preserved it from then all the way until now. It wasn't just the originals that were inspired and perfect. It's what you have today. Because this proves right here that a copy can still be the Word of God just because what you have is a copy of a copy of copies it's still the word of god if god could write down what he wanted wrote down then he can write down what he wrote wanted once written down now you know if you're going to have the victorious christian life you're going to have to have confidence in the words and more times than not at least where i live and i live in the bible belt i live in tennessee where you know we're supposed to be the you know this is supposed to be God's country around here. And these churches here, the pastors, most of them don't use the King James Bible. They use all different kinds of versions of the Bible. And like I said, one time I heard this guy, he got up and he was telling the people to get excited about the Word of God. And he was in this sermon, he was using multiple versions of the Bible, proving that there's no way that he could believe that there is a perfect Bible for today. Because all those Bibles he was using say something different. So he would just say that these were good translations. He wouldn't believe that it's actually the exact perfect word of God that God wanted us to have. So how could we be excited about something that's not perfect? That's not 100% sure. I mean, I get excited about the word of God. I know it's 100% true in my King James Bible. And if you're going to live the victorious Christian life, you're going to have to have faith in the book. It's going to have to be your final authority. And if you believe all these versions that say something different, do you really have the final authority? Or do you become the final authority? 
if you're going around trying to change every word to suit your belief, then are you really making the Bible the final authority or are you the final authority? You can't live the victorious Christian life that way. In chapter 12, you got the Lord's hatred for a land polluted with idols. In Deuteronomy 12, 2 through 3, it says, You shall utterly abolish all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. If you're going to live the victorious Christian life, you're going to have to examine your life from the time you get up to the time you go to bed and make sure that there is no idols there. Make sure that there's not something that's making you slack off on God. <coughs> make sure that there's nothing that you're putting ahead of God. Make sure that there's not some sinful thing in there that's you've got put on the on in the front of your life that's getting all the glory. You're not going to live a victorious Christian life with a life full of idols. You're going to have to go up upon the, on the high mountains and the hills and under every green tree and look and make sure that there's no idols there. You're going to have to overthrow the altars and the pillars and burn the groves with fire. And that's why God doesn't want you going out and hanging, out, hanging around lost people so much that they affect you because they will affect you. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That's why he didn't want Israel joining up with these heathen nations because their gods would be attractive to, to Israel and then they would be a, a land polluted with idols. In chapter 13, you got the false prophet chapter. In Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3, it says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, Whereof he spoke unto thee, saying, Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and serve them, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. This is the false prophet chapter. It's in Deuteronomy 13, and the Antichrist will perform signs and wonders, and he is also connected with the number 13. See Revelation 13. And it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The devil has his false prophets, even today. They're all over YouTube, they're on TV, telling you there's something coming, and then it doesn't come to pass you know what this shows it shows he's a false prophet when they tell you for sure that something is coming i'm not talking about somebody that just speculates and says that they think this will happen i'm talking about somebody that says god showed me that this is going to happen god came to me in a dream and told me that this event's going to happen god gave me a vision that this is going to happen and then it doesn't happen. That's a false prophet. That's somebody that's lying or that's somebody that's hooked up with unclean spirits that's telling them this stuff. And a lot of older people today that I've noticed that talk to me about the Bible, they are being led astray by this. That's who they're preying on, these false prophets and these TV preachers. Maybe a person is older and they can't get out much anymore, but they're a Christian, and they're, they're trying to get spiritually fed somewhere. And of course they get led to a false prophet because that's who's being promoted. The good, the good preachers aren't being promoted. It's the false prophets being promoted. And so they get led to these false prophets, and then they're led off to believe this crazy stuff that never comes to pass. That has nothing to do with the Bible. When somebody's always saying, Thus saith the Lord, and God showed me this or that, and what they're saying is not even in the Bible, you know that this person is a false prophet. 
because what he's saying is not going to come to pass. The time rolls around for that thing to come to pass, and it's just another day just like any other day. And what does this cause to happen? It causes for that Christian that listens to this man, it causes them to lose faith. When the lost person hears it and it doesn't come to pass, what does that do for him? It gives him occasion to blaspheme. It gives him the opportunity to say, well, they've been saying this stuff for years and it never happens. It's not going to happen. That's what he's going to say. And that's the dangers of a false prophet. And if you're going to live the victorious Christian life, you need to realize you have a more sure word of prophecy. As Peter talks about, we're not operating through dreams and visions. We're operating through the word of God itself. Now, chapter 14, it's about clean and unclean things you can eat. So that reminds you, in your victorious Christian life, what are you feasting on? It said in Deuteronomy 14, 3, Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. Now, back then, they couldn't eat certain animals. Under that law, they couldn't eat certain animals. But Paul says in Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. You know, you can eat anything as long as you can give thanks for it. But what can we get out of this, practically speaking, is what are you feasting on? Is what you're, are you getting up every day and feasting on ungodly, abominable things? Is the first thing you do in the morning turn the TV on and watch filthy stuff? Are you feasting on Hollywood movies? Or are you feasting on the Word of God? Are you feasting on the top 100 music songs today? Or are you feasting on the Bible? Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. And Luke 4, 4 says, And Jesus answered, unto him, answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. What are you feasting on? If you are feasting on the things of this world, you're giving the flesh strength. And whatever you feed the most, that's who's going to come out the most. If you're feeding your flesh more than you're feeding the Spirit, then you're going to be walking in the flesh and not walking in the Spirit. And if you're walking for the flesh, you're not living the victorious Christian life. You're going to stop making progress and you're going to begin to wonder. You're going to turn an 11 days journey into 40 years because of what you're feasting on. When you are feasting on horoscopes and psychics and all these things you're feasting on the devil's stuff the world's stuff this is going to get you off track in chapter 16 you got rules on slavery in deuteronomy 15 12 through 17 it says and if thy brother an hebrew man or an hebrew woman be sold unto thee and serve thee six years then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee and when thou sendest him out from, out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Thou shalt give it, give unto him. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee this thing today, and it shall be, if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee, and thine house, because he is well with thee. Then thou shalt take an awl and thrust it through his ear into the door, and he shall be thy servant forever. And also unto thy maidservant thou shalt do likewise. So you have rules on slavery. And in the victorious Christian life, who are you serving? Are you serving the Lord Jesus Christ, your true master? Or are you serving your career? Is your career and your earthly supervisor as he become your true master are you serving the flesh the world and the devil or are you serving the lord jesus christ putting him first you know you can become a slave to sin because at first you think you think that you're in control of the sin but then the sin's in control of you and when you wake up in the morning 
Your life is about how can I get a hold of that sin again? How can I maintain that in my life? You become a slave to it. Whether it be drugs or whatever else, your life revolves around, I've got to get that next pill. I've got to get that next hit. I've got to get that next drink. You become a slave to it. Or are you a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ? All the, all the men in the Bible, at the beginning of their epistles, Paul would say, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Peter, a servant of Jesus Christ. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. James, a servant. They saw themselves as a servant. They were a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be made free from sin, and you want to become a servant to righteousness. When you're a servant to righteousness, you're free. The lost world thinks that they're free because they can go do whatever they want to do, meaning they can go fornicate, they can go cuss and steal and drink and smoke pot. That's not being free because that sin keeps you in bondage. <coughs> You're not free until you begin to live for the Lord and to serve Him. In chapter 17, you got the forbidden practices. In Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12, it says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, <coughs> thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. So God didn't want them around those people and picking up on their sinful habits. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So these are these forbidden practices. And these things are still around today. They made their son or daughter to pass through the fire. They were That means they were sacrificing their own children to these false gods. What are people doing today? They're sacrificing their own children to their false gods. They will they'll, they'll have abortions today. Sacrificing their child to the God of self. They're too full of their self to go through with having the child. They will make their son or daughter to pass through the fire. They will sit around and watch their wicked movies in front of their kids because they love those wicked movies more than their kids. They will drive around in their... In their, in their new car and listen to filthy music that's going to corrupt their kids because that music is their false god. They're making them pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. What do you see on every single show and movie today? You see witches. I mean, witch, they say, well, these are good witches. There's no such thing as a good witch. Where in the Bible do you see a good witch? Or a charmer? Or a consulter with familiar spirits? Or a wizard? Or a necromancer? Somebody that talks to the dead? Or talks to unclean spirits? A consulter with familiar spirits? These things are celebrated today. People want to talk to somebody who might could possibly talk to their dead loved one. They want somebody that can talk to the dead. They want somebody that can get a Ouija board and contact a spirit and possibly tell them the future. You know, if you're involved in these things, I believe a Christian could be involved in these things. But they are far, far away in their walk with the Lord. They are wandering. They're not having a victorious Christian life. These things will keep you from the victorious Christian life. This will bring unclean spirits into your life and they will destroy you. These things are celebrated today. You have these, these wicked Hollywood movies like The Conjuring and things like that that are all about unclean spirits and exorcisms and stuff. You don't want to put all that stuff in your mind and 
the stuff that they're doing on the, the, those movies like that is very unbiblical. You, did you notice that in all these exor exorcist movies, it's about uh, Catholics and Catholic priests? <coughs> and, you know, they're doing very unbiblical stuff because the Catholic Church is just as full of the devil as Harry Potter's school was. I mean, just because it, they, they slap Jesus Christ on it and say that they're serving God does not mean they're serving God. What they're doing doing is a cult. I mean, a Catholic priest probably has many as many devils in him as Lady Gaga or Eminem or Nicki Minaj or all these people that we see as wicked. I mean, Catholic priests are wicked. They have a false gospel. They're leading people to hell. I mean, even just their whole their whole life is is not a victorious Christian life at all. I mean, they forbid to marry. That's called a doctrine of a devil. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, forbidding to marry is a doctrine of a devil. What the nuns are doing, what the Catholic priest does, all these things that they do in secret, the whole idea of a confessional booth, that's wicked and sinful as well. And they are hooked up with unclean spirits. But you want to stay away from things that can can cause unclean spirits to get in your life and cause you to wonder and turn an 11 days journey into 40 years. And moving further on to chapter 31, Joshua is commissioned to lead Israel. <coughs> And as I said, Joshua is a picture of Jesus Christ. Make sure Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in the lead. Paul talks about in Colossians that in all things he might have the preeminence. And he is the head of all things, and by him all things consist. Let him be the leader. In chapter 32, Moses is told he can't enter the promised land. Because you remember what he did. He got angry and he, he smote the rock. He smote, smote the rock when he was just supposed to speak to the rock. And he didn't get to go into the promised land because of that. In chapter 34, you've got the death of Moses. In Deuteronomy 34, 5 through 9, it says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. See, Moses, uh, the devil, and Michael the archangel disputed about the body of Moses. In the book of Jude, it talks about that. And they never found his body. Moses, because Moses is coming back in the tribulation, he's going to be one of the two witnesses. He says, and Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. So he was moving around like a young man when he died. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses has had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Moses passed the mantle on to Joshua. And in your victorious Christian life, you need to be able to pass it on to somebody else as well. You need to be training somebody or people that you can pass it on to when you die. You don't just want to get all the glory for yourself and not pass on what you know to somebody else. In the victorious Christian life, it's not only good to learn things and learn the Bible, you need to pass it on to others. You need to use what you've learned. And in Deuteronomy eighteen fifteen through 16, it shows you Jesus Christ in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy eight fifteen through 16, it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me, 
unto him you shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. So he said, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. This is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet like unto Moses, as it calls him in Acts chapter 7. So, uh, in closing this up, I want to give you some ways that Moses is a picture of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're going to be living a victorious Christian life, you're going to have to be conforming yourself to becoming as like Jesus Christ as you possibly can. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. But the first thing is, Moses and Jesus were born at a time when Israel was in bondage to somebody. When Moses was born, they were in bondage to Egypt. When Jesus was born, they were in bondage to the Romans. Number two, at their birth, babies were being killed. When Moses and Jesus were born, babies were being killed. Pharaoh and Herod were both killing babies. <coughs> Number three, both spent time in the wilderness before starting their ministry. Number four, both Moses and Jesus were shepherds. Number five, Moses and Jesus Christ both fasted 40 days in Exodus 34, 28 and Luke 4, 2. Number six, both Moses and Jesus Christ were known for being humble and meek. Numbers 12, 3 says, Now the man Moses was very meek. Matthew 21, 5 describes Jesus as, a, as being meek. Number seven, in Psalm 106, 16, it talks about how Moses was envied. And as you know, they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ because of envy. See Matthew 27, 18. Number eight, Moses and Jesus Christ have connection with the law. John 1, 17 says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says he came to fulfill the law. In uh, um, or number nine, it says both, uh, both of them were sent to Israel. As you know, Moses was sent to deliver Israel from the bondage of Egypt. Exodus 3.10, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest, mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And you know what it says about Jesus Christ in John 1.11? He came into his own, and his own received him not. And both of them were rejected at first. Number 10, both Moses and Jesus Christ did something with a large body of water. Moses parted the Red Sea. The Lord Jesus Christ calmed the storm and walked on water. Number 11, people were fed miraculously under the care of Moses and Jesus Christ. In Exodus 16, the Lord drops manna from heaven. In Mark 8, 1 through 9, Jesus Christ feeds the 4,000. Number 12, both quenched thirst miraculously. In Exodus 15, 22 through 23, Moses gives drink to thirsty people. In John 4, 10, Jesus describes how he can give a person living water. Number 13, in Matthew 17, both Jesus and Moses met each other on the Mount of Transfiguration. 14, both Moses and Jesus Christ had outstretched arms with a man on each side. Moses had this happen during the war with Amalek when Aaron and Hur were holding his arms up. Jesus Christ had this happen during a spiritual war on Calvary when he had the th two thieves on each side. So both of them had uh, outstretched arms with a man on each side during a war. For Moses, it was a physical war. With Jesus Christ, it was a spiritual war where the unclean spirits were attacking him as he was on the cross dying for our sins. Number 15, Moses and Jesus Christ didn't stay in their burial places after they died. Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead and left the tomb in his glorified body. And God took Moses' body, and the devil don't even know where it is. 16, both men had people wondering about their dead bodies after they died. In the book of Jude, like I said, the devil and Michael, the archangel, disputed about the body of Moses. In Matthew 28, 11 through 15, the soldiers are paid to lie about where Jesus' body went. 
So, so many similarities between Moses and Jesus. And if you're going to live the victorious Christian life, there needs to be so many similarities between you and Jesus. Start trying to be like the Savior and not like your false gods of this world. But I hope this has given you some tips about how to live the victorious Christian life.